So, ladies and gentlemen, dear organizers, thanks. First of all, a big thank you uh, for the invitation and the possibility to present some of my results and ongoing research on this symposium. I would have loved to come to Moscow for the first time, but uh, well, it's not, it's then for next year, so we will see. Uh, although we are now used to work by video, this is the first time that I give a full talk uh, over the net, so we will see how things go on in the next 45 minutes. So as I said, I will present to you in the next 45 minutes some results on thermodynamic properties of solid and liquid oxides using an integrated approach of DFT, molecular dynamics, and key experiments. Uh, it is obvious that I have not performed this work all alone. Uh, therefore, uh, before presenting the results, I want to thank a quite a, 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 long, a short list of colleagues. First of all, my colleagues here in Grenoble, Alain Pasturel, Noel Jacques, Joanna Nuta, and also Alexander Kwan at, at uh, National University of uh, Mises in Moscow, with whom I had a lot of discussions on the topic. And then last but not least, uh, my postdoc, Guillaume Dufresne, who worked a lot on, especially on the Lyme oxygen system, together with Cecilia Alvarez, who is a master's student. And then um, uh, I will acknowledge financial support uh, in the frame of the French R&D program, Cando de l'Energie, and uh, European R&D network, NanoSEM, and also computer resources at Greek here in Grenoble. And not to forget a lot of discussions we had in the, in the French national uh, collaborative network on thermodynamics, which is called Thermat HD. So the outline of the next 40 minutes of my talk is the following. I will start a brief introduction on why we should continue to work on thermodynamics of oxides. And uh, I will make a quick overview how thermodynamic properties were investigated in the past and what we can do differently in the 21st century. I'm convinced that we still need high quality thermodynamic data to advance uh, in the conquest and understand of old and new materials. And I will focus on the thermodynamic properties of alkaline earth oxides to start with, and then go over to uh, and more precisely on lime, magnesium oxide, and strontium oxides, which are the main oxides in this, in this field. And as a second example, I will present some results on alkaline oxides based on lithium, sodium, and potassium. The, these uh, uh, alkaline oxides are, are important in many fields, ranging from battery development, in the case of lithium, to biomass combust combustion, in the case of no sodium and potassium. And, and the main characteristics of these, of these alkaline uh, oxides is that, they are really, that, that there is not much e experimental data available because they are really tricky to measure. Uh, they are so reactive that it's not easy to get uh, very good experimental values. So maybe what, what I will show you today can help to, 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 to get a better understanding how these systems uh, are working. And last but not least, I will show that the presented approach is not limited to oxides. No, first of all, I will, I will show a ternary system, sorry, uh, which is lime, alumina, boron oxide. Uh, this is some recent work we did on phase diagrams, but also including thermodynamic work. Uh, so I initially changed a little bit the, the work from my abstract. In the abstract, I only wanted to pre present uh, lime, aluminica, uh, lime aluminica binary system, but here I, I think it's more interesting to show the ternary system. And then in, in the la last part, I will show uh, uh, calcium sulfur aluminate as a, as a sulf, uh, sulfate bearing system to show that the, the, the approach I will show you today is not limited to oxides only, but can be extended to, calfate, to sulfates, carbonates, chlorides, or other salt, uh, salt or oxygen salt systems. So why thermodynamics of oxides? Why should we still continue to work on that? First of all, because a lot of scientific areas are concerned. As an example for some basic work and fundamental understanding, one can cite earth science uh, and, and geology and planetology as represented here by the volcano and, uh, and the moon. Uh, thermodynamics can help us to gain fundamental understanding on phase formation, especially under extreme conditions, uh, as very high temperature and high pressure, uh, because they're very hard to, uh, to make in the lab. Uh, this concerns mainly silicates and aluminates of calcium magnesium, but with some additions of some multivalence elements such as iron, and titanium. 
and and in in the case of planetology, the starting point is always a complex gas phase at very high temperature, with which through condensation becomes liquid and then solid, and uh, and therefore the, the the reaction sequence is very interesting to to investigate. And and lastly, as the time horizon is geological, thermodynamic equilibrium can be assumed in in in, in very very often in many cases. The second field is more familiar as it concerns industrial applications of oxides. Uh, as I show in this slide here is building materials. And you see on the left is a, is a, a cement work plant to produce cement clinker. And on the right side, you see the use of concrete. This is a picture of Grenoble and a very famous tower here in Grenoble, which is one of the first buildings made of uh, reinforced concrete. Uh, here, thermodynamics uh, is helping us uh, in two ways. In, 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 on the left side, so on the on the on the uh, synthesis, it's a high temperature process. So uh, natural raw materials, limestone, clay, sand are mixed together, are ground and mixed together, and then uh, put into a high temperature rotary kiln where they react and make calcium silicates and aluminates. So it's clear that in the flame, which is uh, close to 16, 17, 1800 degrees Celsius, uh, uh, equilibrium is not so far off. So having good data is, is uh, very important in order to, to, to understand and to improve the process. On the right side is the, is the, um, the, the, the as I said, the concrete thermodynamics here, it's not so much a high temperature, but it's more aqueous thermodynamics so the, the cement is uh, re uh, mixed with water and it reacts. And here, uh, uh, again, the high quality data is needed because at this, at room temperature or close to room temperature, thermodynamics alone is not governing the system. Uh, it's clear that a lot of phenomena in this uh, temperature range are kinetic. And it's good to always uh, to, to, to determine whether what you observe has a ther thermodynamic origin or a kinetic origin. So very really good data can help us to, to, to improve uh, our understanding. And other industrial products uh, are shown here on the left side, metallurgical slags, uh, which are also used as building materials, but not only, some of them is still dumped uh, into, into nature because it's not used. So it's a shame that it's not used. I think we should do something with these metallurgical slags. And on the right side, glass uh, production. Uh, in this case, in both cases, the thermodynamic properties are important for the liquid state. So it's multi-component, high temperature. But then at room temperature, uh, when, when uh, the samples are cooled down, uh, everything is meter stable. So we have glasses, we have amorphous glasses, amorphous state. And, uh, and, and we want to have also high good quality data for these meter stable areas. And I will show a little bit later and come back to this point. So how can we determine experimentally the thermodynamic properties of oxides? Well, this is a very old story and started basically in the 19th century with the development or in, in parallel with the development of colorimeters. And in the case of oxides, basically we have two types of equipment. On the left side, we have a combustion colorimeter, a very old one. There are moderns also, you can, kill, but you can still buy them. And uh, here it's the important point that you react a metal with a certain amount of oxygen and you measure the heat upon reaction. And, uh, and so this gives you then the heat of formation of the, of the metal oxide. Uh, in the case of lime uh, or magnesia, it may be straightforward because uh, lime uh, CaO or MgO is formed. But in the case of systems where you can have a, a series of uh, multiple oxides, I, I think about titanium or, or other valence, high valence oxides, you may not end up with a single oxide. So it's very important to characterize uh, carefully your sample after reaction. And sometimes it's not even crystalline, but you get an amorphous. It's, so it's not always straightforward to get high quality data out of combustion colorimetry. On the right side, a solution colorimetry is then used if you have higher order oxides, because then you can uh, refer them to the simple oxides that you measured before by combustion colorimetry. And uh, basically you have two methods, either solution colorimetry at moderate temperature uh, using uh, borates or, or molybdates as a solvent. 
or you can use aqueous chemistry uh, using acids as a solvent. So this, with this equipment, normally you should get a nice value for the heat of formation, but still you would need the data for the temperature dependence. And so you have to, two, basically two techniques. You have the, the low temperature adiabatic calorimetry, uh, one example on the left side uh, of a Russian equipment. There are also some American and, 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 and French equipments. But the one characteristic is that there aren't many around anymore of these uh, adiabatic calorimeters. And on the right side, you see a result from magnesium oxide, uh, basically from the few Kelvin up to room temperature, and you can derive then the, the, entropy, the entropy of the standard entropy at room temperature from this equipment. This equipment is very precise uh, from, a, from a measurement point of view. Uh, the, the main uh, critical point is the sample, and I will show you a little bit later a result on Lyme why this uh, point uh, is critical. Uh, when it goes to high temperature, basically, again, you have two, uh, one way of doing, which is the heat content measurements. So you measure H uh, from a temperature, a higher temperature, minus H at room temperature. So you can use two types of calorimeters, uh, either uh, a direct calorimetry, that means you start a sample from room temperature and you drop it in a calorimeter, which is heated. This is limited to 1500 uh, Celsius. If you want to go to higher temperature, you have to do it the other way around. You have to heat the sample up to the temperature from 1500 to 3000. And, and then you can drop it into a calorimeter at room temperature. The main difficulties here are the temperature measurements and the reaction of the sample with the crucibles or the vapor, vaporization effects. So again, the higher you go to temperature, the more difficult is the, the measurement. And last but not least, you also have uh, Gibbs energy-based measurements, so either uh, electromotive force, force measurements here on the left side, or Newton diffusion mass spectrometry. In both cases, you measure activities. And from these acti activities, you can derive Gibbs energies and get temperature data uh, like this. So in the old times, what you did is then you use the data and you put it into compilations, thermodynamic compilations. And uh, on the left side, you, you see some of the books that you may have in your lab. Uh, you have the Janov books, you have the thermodynamic data from Barin and Knacke or, or the Gurvich compilation. And, and uh, the point is here that very often you have the tabulation, but you also have functions. Uh, let's say now for 30 years, we, we, we tend to put these data into thermodynamic databases electronically. And uh, the advantage is that you can use then directly the data with Gibbs energy minimizers. And with the Gibbs energy minimizers, you can, uh, you can do thermodynamic uh, calculations. And this is, uh, so in the compilations, you basically have uh, stoichiometric phases, but then you can also use the, the data to, uh, to do Kalfa type modeling. And I show just an example here where you have the magnesium oxide, aluminum oxide system. And, and, and you see that the spinel phase or the liquid phase have rather complex models in order to, to describe their composition dependency correctly. Uh, so this is, the, let's say, the, the old way up to now, how we do things, and, and now it becomes the important new stuff. We can do calorimetry uh, by, uh, by doing uh, work with uh, numerical calculations, which is, was not possible before. And I also consider this as a numerical calorimetry, because in, in real calorimetry, you, you measure the heat of a, a compound with respect to the constituents, and in, in, uh, in uh, the numerical calorimetry, you do the same. The only thing what you do is you do the calculations. So you calculate the, the internal energy of the compounds and the constituents. And by difference, you also get the energy information. How do we do this? Well, the, the, the magic word is DFT, so density functional theory. So you compute the electronic structure of the of matter and to get the ground state properties of the system. And one of the ground state properties if the, is the ground state energy. Uh, but you also get the, the, the crystal structure, the, the stable crystal structure and the, the lattice parameters. 
And to do this, we start from the von Oppenheimer approximation where we consider only the electron to move, the electrons to move and the nuclei are fixed. And, and, and then we try to solve the, the cohn sharm equation, which is here. And in these cohn sharm equations, you have what is called the exchange functional. And classically, we have the, the, what is called the LDA exchange functional and the GGA exchange functional. But more recently, since uh, 2015, there is what we call the meta GGA, which is called SCAN, strongly constrained and appropriately normed semi local density functional. And all calculations I will show in this presentation have been performed with this SCAN functional. And the idea is to show you that the, the results we get are pretty impressive and that in the future we can use these type of calculations to derive thermodynamic data for, for oxides also. So how we do we do this? We start from the, from the initial structure. So we have an initial uh, density of the electrons and, and, and then we, we uh, try to resolve the cohn sharm equation and then we get a new density. And this is an iterative approach uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the, the atoms are moved and the electrons are calculated until I get the minimum of the energy. And when the, the energy is minimized and the, 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 um, the forces on the ions are zero, I consider that I reached equilibrium. And so then gives, the, so this gives the total energy of zero K. But when we go to high temperature properties, we, we need uh, a lattice theory. And, and there we compute the, the phonon spectrum, as you can see on the right for CAO. And from this phonon spectrum and the energies of the phonons of the lattice vibration, we can calculate the, the Helmholtz free energy uh, in the harmonic approximation as given by this formula. And from this Helmholtz free energy, using classical thermodynamics, I can calculate then the entropy and the, the uh, heat capacity at constant volume. And, uh, and uh, if I want the heat capacity at the constant pressure, then I just have to calculate a series of, uh, of uh, Helmholtz free energies at different volumes. And like this, uh, I can calculate the Gibbs energy. And from the Gibbs energy, uh, as given here, the, the second derivative of the temperature, I can calculate the, the heat capacity. So if I then have the heat capacity, uh, I, I can either make a polynomial fit as it was done in the past, or what is more and more done in the Calvert community is use an Einstein model, where we have one Einstein temperature or multiple Einstein temperatures uh, to, to fit the, the, the heat capacity. And, and it's clear that at high temperature, uh, this is only valid at low temperatures. So if we want to go to high temperature, we need some extra terms in order to get good agreement with the, with the experimental values. And so if we sum up everything together, then we can get the Gibbs energy. And so first of all, the heat of formation, uh, we calculated at zero K and I get an example here for lime. Look at zero K, we have CaO minus the energy of zero K for calcium minus half the energy of oxygen gas. And uh, so this gives me the energy of formation at zero K. And then because I have lattice contribution, even at zero K, which is called the so-called zero point energy, I have to do the same with the calculated zero point energies that I got from the lattice calculations. And then as I have the CP from zero to room temperature, I can calculate the Delta H from zero to 298 which is just the heat content from, uh, in this case, lime, calcium, and oxygen gas. And if I sum up all the three contributions, I get the heat of formation, and the heat of conformations I will present later in this, in, in this talk are all calculated in this way. And when it comes to the liquid phase in the Calvert community, uh, which becomes more and more the standard, is uh, the so-called two-state model, where I consider that the liquid phase has two contributions, an amorphous phase and the liquid phase. And, and from this amorphous phase, so amorphous solid-like phase, uh, when I go up at high temperature, the liquid uh, contribution uh, takes over and becomes more important. And this is just a mathematical uh, way of, uh, of uh, treating this uh, description of the liquid phase. I will not go into details. I will show you some examples later in the, in the presentation. So after this rather uh, long introduction, I will come to, to show you some examples. And I start with the alkaline earth oxides. 
And uh, I, I will only show uh, the, the single oxides, the magnesium oxides, calcium oxide, and strontium oxide. I won't go and discuss peroxides. So the, the structure is pretty, pretty simple. It's a cubic structure, uh, M minus 3M. A lattice uh, space group. And here I will show you uh, the calculated results uh, compared to the measured results. On the left side, you see magnesium oxides, and you see a very, very good agreement between the work done by uh, Gmelian in 69 here in Grenoble and, uh, and uh, work by Watanabe in 93. And the calculated entropy is basically exactly the entropy that, uh, that Gmelian derived from his measurements. So that was very satisfying. And so we said, okay, let's, let's try uh, calcium oxide and strontium oxide. And you see calcium oxide, we, we have to shift uh, the values from Gmelin, which are these the crosses, are, are way below the, the value we calculate. And, and therefore, the calculated entropy uh, of uh, 40.2 joules per mole in Kelvin is, is smaller, is higher than what uh, Gmelin derived from his data. So the question is, are our calculations wrong? Is the method not good enough to, uh, to, to, be, uh, to describe the, the data for lime oxide? or may the problem be in the measurement. So then we compare to strontium and you see on the left side strontium is again basically right uh, on, on the line and with a very good agreement with Gmelin. So if you come back now to, to the to lime oxide, what, what, what can be the origin? And, and, and there it, it can be sometimes tricky when you go to the old literature because uh, in, in the paper uh, in 69 Gmelin re, uh, referred for the sample preparation to a paper which was in the, in the French uh, journal uh, Contre du des Académies des Sciences. And, and if you read that paper, you realize that the lime sample he used had a porosity of 30%. So he, he made a sample at very high temperature and quenched it and re-annealed it. And, and, and the sample really had 30% of porosity. So, and, and, and there you can ask, and this was not the case for the magnesium oxide and strontium oxide he used. So I'm, uh, unless uh, we, we, somebody remeasured uh, the sample more carefully, I'm, I'm more convinced about the calculations uh, than, uh, than the measurements. Why that? If you look at the standard heat of formation calculated also by the same approach, you see that the value for lime using DFT and phonon calculations is exactly what is uh, measured uh, and, and, and compiled in the Janov and the Gorovich uh, compilations. So there's really an extremely good agreement. The agreement is a little bit less good for magnesium oxide and strontium oxide, where we have errors which are less than 2%, uh, but still it's reasonable. If you compare that with, uh, with the old TGA uh, derived uh, calculations, which are way F off and which very often have to be corrected manually in order to get an agreement. Here, the scan the functional as employed in, in my calculations gives directly a very good result. When it comes to the high temperature part, you see that uh, the agreement, so if we extrapolate uh, to, to very high temperature, is extremely good. Uh, so the DFT derived calculations are good, uh, let's say until uh, 1300 degrees Kelvin, upper roughly two, or, or let's say 1800. It's roughly half or two thirds of the melting point. And what about higher temperature? And you see here these, these blue dots here. And these blue dots are calculated by up initial DFT calculations. So we used again the scan functional and, and do molecular dynamics calculation. And it's clear that it's very, very time consuming in terms of calculation because uh, you have a lot of atoms in order to make it correctly. You have to have at least three to 400 atoms in the cell. And, and therefore, if you do a full up initial calculation, it's, it's not straightforward in terms of time. But it gives you excellent results. As you see by the three points, they are basically within the experimental uncertainty. If you use classical uh, molecular dynamics, you see that the agreement is not so good. Still reasonable, but not, not so good as the molecular dynamics. So that is probably one of the, the first conclusion. If you have a system for which you don't have any data, uh, up initial molecular dynamics may be a good way of calculating things and, and give you an idea. 
But what about the liquid phase now? So we have a nice uh, data set for the solid phase. And then when you look at the literature, you see it's a mess. So here you, I, I plotted just three versions of the, of the liquid phase. You see uh, Janaf, uh, which uh, was uh, taken as a reference for the FACT uh, pure substance database. And they assumed a CP of 63 uh, joule per moles and Kelvin. And a melting point, uh, which is here, which is uh, at 2,800 uh, Kelvin. SGTE, in their database, they assumed a much higher melting point, around 3,100 something. And also, they assumed a much higher, uh, higher heat, uh, uh, heat capacity in the liquid phase of 83 uh, joules per mole in Kelvin. So the question is now, which is the good melting point? which is the good CP in the liquid, which is the good heat of fusion, and where is the glass transition? So four questions in principle you should always ask in when you have uh, uh, an extrapolation of the liquid phase down to room temperature. And so in, in, in this case, it's not straightforward because you cannot make a, a, an amorphous uh, lime sample. It's physically impossible. And even in calculation, it's impossible. We did not succeed in, in uh, a initial molecular dynamics calculation to, to, to go down to room temperature. So it's impossible to make a, an amorphous uh, lime sample. However, what we did, we can calculate the time temperature. And so this is done by classical thermodynamics, uh, sorry, classical molecular dynamics. But we checked the values also by uh, ab initio for some points. And you see, we confirm that the higher CP of the liquid, which is around 80 joules, 83 joules per Kelvin, which is the one which is also favored by in the Gurwitch uh, compilation. So here, clearly, the assumption or the estimation by, uh, by Janaf is wrong, and, and it, it should be corrected. Uh, this, by the way, was more or less confirmed also for magnesium oxide in a recent paper by a Vienna group which also found a higher value in, uh, in, uh, in the CP. And then the diffusion the also was measured recently uh, at around uh, 3,200 Kelvin. And again, by calculation, we confirmed this value, uh, this higher value. Our calculated value is at 3,170, so very close to the value they, they measured. And the last but not least, the, the heat of fusion is around 81 kilojoules per uh, mole, which is, means that you have an entropy of fusion of 25 joules per mole in Kelvin, which is also an estimation done in the Gurvich compilation. And I think this is, the, or we think this is the right one. So using now this new CAO, what we did, we did the Kalfat uh, type assessment of the lime oxygen system. And this is just to show you that it perfectly matches the experimental values, which, uh, well, I didn't plot it, but uh, you can trust me, they are, they are here, the liquid solubility in, in pure calcium, and here you get the melting point. And that's something that's probably worthwhile just to discuss uh, one minute. The melting point we calculate is the congruent melting point, but this one is something that you never can measure because the, the, the melting point depends on the, on the oxygen partial pressure. And in pure, uh, the, so the congruent melting point is 3,222. And here the assessed one in uh, one bar of oxygen is 2,221.7. And when you go to lower oxygen partial pressures, you get a lower value. So therefore, always be careful when you, when you trust the melting points of very high materials that the oxygen partial pressure may be a, 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 a tricky parameter to, to control experimentally and, and therefore the, the values should be taken with care. So the next topic I want to discuss is alkali oxides. And basically I, I, I will discuss three uh, structural types or three groups. The first group is uh, the, the alkali 2 oxy, oxide. And, and then you have the, the peroxide, uh, Li2O2, Ni2O2, KTO2, and the, the, the superoxide, LiO2, Ni2O2, KO2. And for example, in room temperature uh, under air conditions, so 0.21 of oxygen, only these peroxide is a stable uh, one. 
the data is very, there is not much data in the literature. This is because it's very, very complicated to measure. Here is uh, one example is the one for lithium two oxide and the calculated uh, value by DFT phonon is, is given here. And you see the agreement at low temperature is very good. And we have some discrepancy here uh, starting from 600. And it's clear that uh, because the melting point is around, uh, around 1100, it's clear that the, the DFT uh, phonon calculations are only good up to 5, 600 K. So I would say uh, starting from here, uh, it, it may be better to follow the experimental values. And you, see, you can see that here also, if you have uh, heat content, that you start to derive from the heat contents. But overall, the agreement is good. Uh, this is also, uh, this is also uh, uh, given by the fact that we get a nice value for the heat of formation. Here you see the calculated one. Uh, so it's at room temperature, corrected with uh, zero point energy and heat content. And you see, we are basically in very good agreement with two of the, of the reported values. For lithium-2 oxide-2, we get a, a good agreement at the, at the room temperature, and, and then we deviate. Uh, maybe our calculation, maybe the experiments. Again, experiments are very tricky in this case, but they are very, very reactive. Our calculated heat of formation is right in the middle between the two uh, experimental values. A another interesting feature of the, of the calculation is that you also can calculate the gas species. And I did that again with the scan functional and, and the gas uh, species. And you see the agreement is very, very uh, not bad. Uh, for, for pure lithium, we basically find the same value that you get in the Janov compilation. For lithium oxide, uh, at least we have the right tendency. Uh, we found 50 and the experimental value was 84 plus minus 21. So the error bar is pretty large. And for uh, Li2O, the value is rather negative. And again, we, we find the right tendency. So I think <coughs> the proposed method may be also a good way to check uh, guess, uh, guess data if you find them in the literature in order to see if the order of magnitude is correct. When it comes to sodium oxide, there is only one, no, there are two heat content measurements and that's all. So again, the heat of formation we calculate is in very, very good agreement with the, with the literature values, the measured values. <coughs> and then comes the, uh, the starting point why we started this work on, on alkali oxide is to have and to check the data on potassium oxide. And there you see that the, the estimated data in the, in, in the literature, which is based on, on, on Janov, is, is uh, not so bad for the heat of formation. So we have an error of, let's say, 3 to 4 percent. But the entropy derived from the low temperature heat capacity measurements are really completely different. So they're much uh, higher in the case of, uh, in, in both cases, which may end up in the, in the end, give you the same, uh, the same uh, Gibbs energy, at least at room temperature, because both balance a little bit, but when it goes then to higher temperature, uh, it, it may give different values. So now these values can be used to, to make a full uh, Kalfert assessment to see how this behaves in the multi-component system. <coughs> so the next example I will give is the lime uh, alumino uh, boride system. So in this system, again, not much uh, information in the literature. There is one isothermal section uh, at 800 uh, degrees. And there are three compounds reported in the literature. Two compounds, uh, calcium Al2B2O7 and calcium AlBO4, which are reported in the high temperature isothermal section. And one compound, which is a natural uh, occurring uh, um, mineral, called the Yohadi uh, light. Uh, it is not available. Uh, there's no thermodynamic data available. It's not even in the phase diagram. So from a structural point of view, they are also different. <coughs> the, the two on the left 
the aluminium coordination is ALO4. So they have four co coordinated aluminium in the structure. On the right side, the aluminium is six coordinated. And therefore, the authors in the literature who said the investigated said it must maybe be a pressure uh, stabilized compound. So only available at, at high pressure uh, due to this uh, peculiar, peculiar coordination of aluminum atoms of all six. <coughs> so we started the experimental work. So as I said before, on the left side, you see uh, uh, the isothermal section from the experiments at 800 degrees Celsius. On the right side, you see a one calculator from the FactSense database. And overall, the two compounds are there, but what you see is a really strange low temperature eutectic on the lime rich side. And we said it, it's not possible because the starting point of the study was to work uh, with the system in building uh, material sectors of so really lime rich. And we said, if you want to have uh, something correct, we cannot, we cannot leave this low temperature eutectic. It must be an artifact of the, of the modeling. So we did the calculation. <coughs> And from the heat capacity, uh, not much a surprise. Uh, the, the dotted line is the neumann kopp rule, so the sum of lime, alumina, and boron oxide. And you see that basically for these two compounds, <coughs> we, uh, we get a, a neumann kopp behavior. So no surprise on that. But then if we go to the, to the natural occurring compound, it's a little bit below, not much, but a little bit below. But the big surprise came when we looked at the heat formation and the delta S with respect to the oxides. And you see that the heat of formation com com compared to the fact search database are much less negative. And that in the contrast, the delta S is much higher, much more positive. So these, at least the two first compounds with the ALO4 structure are entropy stabilized. That means the Gibbs energy becomes more than negative when the temperature goes up. And uh, despite the fact that the delta CP with respect to the, to the basic oxides is almost zero. So it's clearly that the low temperature part from zero to room temperature have, have a big influence on these values. And, and, and uh, the, the third one, so the natural occurring has a negative entropy of formation. So apparently, if you have OLO6 in the structure, <coughs> you, um, you, you get a completely different behavior in terms of entropy. So if you produce now Gibbs energies out of these data and, and, and try to calculate, you see that these so supposed to be a stable only at pressure compound is stable at 25 degrees Celsius. And if you calculate then it decomposes at uh, let's say around 400 to 450 degrees Celsius. At that high temperature, you really find what is uh, known from the literature. So it's clearly that the, the so-called high pressure only compound does exist at room temperature, so at, at, at low temperature. So it's really a stable phase under normal conditions. <coughs> so we also uh, did some experimental work in order to determine the, the liquidus relations. And it's clear, you can see uh, the, the low temperature compound doesn't exist uh, because uh, it's, it's not uh, stable at high temperature. But with these two compounds, uh, ternary compounds, uh, they ha uh, have some associated reactions. And now everything is there to make a full Kalfan assessment of these systems if everybody is, uh, somebody's interested in it. So last but not least, uh, it's the calculation of the calcium sulfur illuminate. This is a very important compound in new cements because it's highly reactive towards water. And again, uh, no, uh, no, uh, only a limited amount of thermodynamic data was available. So we calculated the structure, the ground state properties. We did the phonon calculations. And here, just to show you, uh, you see the entropy of formation uh, with respect to the reaction given above. And our calculation, which is on the right, is in very good agreement with the, 
uh, net enthalpy of solution measurement by acid dissolution by Costa at early the 70s. But all the other subsequent data is much more negative and can be now discarded in the in the in the discussion. Uh, there was even some positive value which can also be discarded. So we can now really assure that the value should be in this ballpark and not like this. So my conclusions. So thermodynamic data for oxide are still important for many fields and applications, as I've shown you, uh, for fundamental science, but also for applications. And I think the theoretical tools are now mature to generate high quality data. Uh, DFT calculations using the scan functional is 0k. And then when you add lattice, uh, lattice uh, dynamics, you can have uh, properties at higher temperature. And when it comes to very high temperature, Apinesia molecular dynamics really gives you interesting results. Uh, with the drawback that computers are still not uh, fast enough to, to get the results quickly. So you still have to wait, uh, to wait for, for a week or, or sometimes a month to get the result. But things improve in the future. And I, I think this can be uh, then uh, a, a good way of, of generating new data. The progress in theory and the experiments are both important. <coughs> in the theory, we can use that it for systems for which experimental conditions are difficult to, to, to install. As I've shown for the alkali oxides, uh, which are so reactive uh, with respect to CO2 and water vapor, uh, it may be much better to do calculations uh, than doing the experiments. And, uh, and we tried that. We tr tried now for one and a half year to get something out of it and still haven't succeeded to get something reasonable out. So it, it, it's really uh, sometimes calculations are quicker. But experiments are still very important, especially to check calculations and then also to, to, for systems in which calculations are really too complicated. For example, in solid solutions uh, or in, in, in compounds with partial occupancy, uh, it's much faster to, to do the experiment than to do the calculations, if the sample uh, synthesis is possible. And I think my, at least my focus in the future will be modeling on of meter stable phases, liquids, and especially liquid oxides below the melting point. It can be by ab initio molecular dynamics. And, uh, and, and then they do call for two-state model in order to get multi-component systems. But it's also important in solid solutions, uh, ranges in composition areas where we cannot get any experimental data. But the models need input values. I think there, this is very important to continue also this work on modeling of meter-stable phases. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alex. Now, questions are welcomed. Um, I would like to ask audience again to write what question in the chat if there are any questions. No questions? Okay, um, I probably have one. Alex, can you go to the slide um, with lithium oxide? Lithium oxide, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, what is, there is a kind of a jump between 51 John and uh, 78 Fan at the think about room temperature. Is there any, what is the mismatch about it? I don't know where the jump comes from. It's just, I, I think it's just a measurement error. Uh, okay. Because uh, uh, fund just started at room temperature, mm -hmm. well, probably a little bit of room temperature. So potentially the low temperature part is not good. And, and things improve and then, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Okay. Um, there is a question from Igor Abrikosov. Igor, Professor Abrikosov, yes. yes, sir. Alexander, thank you very much for an excellent talk. Very interesting. Uh, I, I understand that the question may be, uh, uh, yeah. 
is there any hope that uh, thermodynamics can be measured uh, at high pressure? So what about high pressure? You, you said that oxides are extremely important uh, in geoscience and high pressure physics, and I fully agree on that. Uh, any hope of getting thermodynamic data at high pressure? I think uh, using ab initio molecular dynamics, you, you can uh, yeah, calculate pressure thing, yeah. dependence. Yeah. But again, it will take a, uh, a lot of computer power to do so. Because you have no, to do no it in multiple. To, no way to doing it experimentally. Ah, experimentally, there are experiments. But they are limited to, to a certain amount of pressure. And, uh, and they are also very tricky to measure because you, you, you very often you have, uh, you have um, diamond pistons and then you measure and it, it's it's really uh at, at moderate pressures you can measure in pressure cells uh dc measurements in pressure cells but if it comes to very high pressure it's tricky again you can probably make the samples uh, and then and then uh, if you have the samples quenched in this high pressure state you can measure the the, the heat of formation and, and thermodynamic properties but really directly measure in the high pressure state. I think crystalline properties, so the crystal structure and the uh, and, uh, and, uh, lattice parameters, this you can do. And this has been done. There's a lot of work in the literature. But then you, you can compare that to calculations. But really, measuring high, high thermodynamic data is complicated. OK. Uh, more questions? No. If that is not the case, then we should... Oh, there is a comment from Irina Spenska. Will you say it yourself? Uh, okay, I should read. Um, she writes, thank you, Alex, for, uh, very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, uh, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Um,